everything I'm going to teach you this morning and everything that we've been working on throughout this teaching series the people who have the greatest Jesus effect in their life are the people who go through life connected with other people who are connected to Jesus. Does that make sense? You know, we've learned that in every area of life. <clears throat> if you want to work on what you eat, just find a half a dozen people who will partner with you and go on an eating plan together. And your chances of succeeding go way up than if you decide in a closet somewhere you're just going to eat differently. If you're going to run a marathon, find a group you can train with and your chances of training and completing a marathon go way up if you have a group that you train and run with. It's a simple principle of life. We go further together. Can you say that with me? Let's say it together. Ready? Ready? We go further together. And that's why at New Life we offer community groups. And um, so for 52 minutes, our signups have gone live online and you can now sign up for a community group. So now listen to me carefully. If you're already in a community group, you can relax. We didn't flush you out and you have to sign up again. You're, you're already in. But for those of you who are brand new and those of you who don't have a community group yet, everything on the inside of me wants you to have that experience. I have a community group because I go further in life when I take that journey with other people. Actually, I have like three different groups of people that I take the journey of life with, not counting my family. And it takes that many of them to keep me in line. <laughs> yeah, right. I know that to be true. <clears throat> so that's an experience I want for, for all of you. If you go to our website, uh, www.newlife. Uh, www.newlifepetaluma.com. There you go. Um, and you click on the groups tag, tab. There's a place that says uh, available groups. Click on that and it will show you, I think there's, I don't know, 21 different groups that have some place of availability in them. Uh, so take a look, read the descriptions. If you don't, if you're old school, and, and online doesn't mean on the internet to you, okay? If you're old school, you can just go find somebody in the lobby that has a shirt like this, and they will take you to one of those newfangled things called a computer, and they will sign you up, all right? Uh, because we, we don't want anyone to miss out. One of my favorite stories uh, of our church was we had a Sunday call, Bring Your Tablet, because we wanted everybody to sign up on this online database that we we're moving our whole church to. And a really good friend of mine who was, I don't know, in his early 50s, certainly young enough to be online. After I helped all these people sign up, I hear this voice behind me, hey, pastor, could you help me with my tablet? I turned around and say, yeah, sure. And he holds out a legal pad. This is my tablet right here. <laughs> and it just reminded me that we all go through life differently. So we don't want to leave anybody out. And we, we open enrollment runs from today through the 29th. So it's two weeks and one day. And, uh, and then we have a whole new launch coming up, and it's going to be so good. So there you go. If you have questions, you can ask me or anybody with a group shirt on today. We'll be happy to answer your questions and help you get signed up. Now, let's talk about the Jesus effect. Because the Jesus effect is this amazing thing that happens in our lives where he changes us. He actually shapes us. And I want, I want to start out in this, in this teaching, I'm going to read you three different passages from the Bible that are three of my favorites because they are, they are places that God has used to shape my own identity and to help give shape to my life. And so there are three of my favorites. And let's start with the first one. It says, when God is personally present. And I just want to say, at the end of what I'm teaching today, 
If you're not already a Jesus follower, I'm going to give you the opportunity to make that decision. And here's why. When God is personally present, when you intentionally invite God into your life, here's what happens. We are transfigured. That means we are being shaped. If you can think of your life as a lump of clay on a potter's wheel, and when you invite God in, it's his hands. This is the Jesus effect. And he begins to shape our lives. And notice what he says, much like Jesus. Our lives gradually become brighter and more beautiful as God enters our lives and we become like Jesus. I love our church. Uh, and by the way, if you're here for the first time, you're part of our church today, okay? I love our church for many reasons. But I was just reading an email this week, and I'm sorry I didn't bring it to you where I could read you the exact quote. But it's from somebody who's been in our church maybe a year, year and a half. And she wrote, she wrote me and she said, Pastor, every time I walk in the door, of the church, I get overwhelmed by this feeling of love and acceptance, and I get moved to tears, and I love what she said right after that, and that's not easy or often for an English woman. <laughs> I get moved to tears because I've never felt this kind of love anywhere I've ever been in the world. That is the Jesus effect. It's what we just read about. Our lives becoming gradually brighter and more beautiful as God enters our lives and we become like Jesus. So the big question is this, how does that happen? You just show up at church and I don't know, something magical happens and every, day, every time you show up, you leave a little differently. Well, I'm sure that's part of it. But there's a whole process. And in the three teachings of this series, we've been focusing on how that happens. And so the first teaching was the Jesus effect changes my perspective. In other words, it changes my eyes. It's as if when I invite Jesus into my life, he begins to drop a lens over my eyes that changes how I see the world. Before, I see billions of individual people struggling to make their way through life. But when the Jesus lens goes on, I begin to see a vast network of interconnected people who form what we call the we. I see a part of me in every person I encounter. And we said, we learn to see the we in terms of, are you my neighbor? We begin to look at every person on planet earth as somehow connected to us and our neighbor. Week number two, we talked about God changing out, not, not just our eyes, but actually changing our heart, how we feel. And Angela talked to us about our circles of love and the people that we are close to and how it begins to change our proximity. And here's a little diagram. I know our circle of love is supposed to go around everybody, but you can see that we tend to warp it a little bit. All of us do this. I struggle with this. It's very difficult in my circle of love and acceptance to invite into my circle people who are vastly different from me that I don't understand. People who I disapprove of how they live and what they do. And the hardest one is the people who have hurt me. How do I draw my circle of love around them? Because we learn that the Jesus effect changes my proximity. And who could forget this picture 
that Angela showed us last week of, of, of this girl, uh, Kashia, who at 18 years of age at a KKK rally put her body over the top of a white supremacist. And basically she said, if you're going to hurt him, you have to hurt me first. I was looking at that picture and I saw something truly outstanding. Look at her sweatshirt. I know what it's supposed to say. I know it's supposed to say USA, but what does it really say? Us. She saw the we in the crowd. And she said, there's just us. That's it. There's a little video, and it's got a tiny trailer on the front end that you might think is funny. I don't, I don't care if you do or you don't. But it's a, it's, a, <laughs> it's a Brene Brown video that teaches us a powerful principle about the difference between sympathy and empathy. Now, sympathy is something we all feel, where our heart is somehow touched by the plight of another person. But empathy is something altogether different, and it comes with the Jesus effect. Take a look at this video. <gasps> there you go. Was that funny? Okay. All right. So what is empathy? And why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. I know what it's like down here, and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, you want a sandwich? <laughs> um, empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. How about that? That's proximity, folks. What makes things better is connection. That's the Jesus effect. We don't offer a sandwich. We get in the pit with people, and we walk with them. Because life is better connected. We're learning that. So today, we're going to talk about the fact that the Jesus effect can actually not just change my eyes and not just change my heart, but actually change my hands. And I want to remind you of something as we, as we press into this. <clears throat> Jesus changed the world more than any other figure who's ever walked on the face of the earth. That's undeniable. The statistics are all there. 
I just want to remind all of us that Jesus is not known and remembered for what he saw. He's not known and remembered for how he felt about people. Jesus is known and remembered for what he did. Because it's in the doing that our lives are actually shaped. But there's a little challenge in that because <clears throat> oftentimes I can feel bad about not doing the things that I should be doing. And so instead of saying to Jesus, would you please change my eyes so I can see people differently? Would you please change my heart so I can feel about people differently? I just go, what am I supposed to be doing? I'll just go straight and try to do that. And that doesn't end well. It just ends with more guilt. So I'm going to put a new idea on the table. And here it is. What if the thing that drives us isn't supposed to be a picture of something we think we should be? I should be doing that. I should be doing this. I should be doing that. And get all these mental pictures of things we should be doing what if that isn't what's supposed to drive us at all? What if it should be rather a natural desire or drive that comes from who we already are? Now that's a big idea and it's way different. So let's dive into that because I want to tell you that there are two things that are available to you that are inside of you that actually can motivate you to do what you want to do, but often don't get done. But if you'll tap into them, it's such a great process. So I'm going to read you another one of my favorite scriptures. And this, this story comes from the life of Jesus. And, and it's a conversation between a guy by the name of Nicodemus and Jesus. And incidentally, in the end, Nicodemus and Jesus become best friends. I mean, great friends. They became so close that after Jesus was killed on the cross and crucified, Nicodemus was the one who said, I have a tomb. Could I take his body and put it in my tomb? This is that guy. So he comes to Jesus early in Jesus' ministry, and they're talking about what it means to be a Jesus follower. And they're talking about this kingdom that Jesus is going to establish that Nicodemus doesn't know at that time would later on be called the church, the kingdom of Jesus. And Jesus says something to Nicodemus that rocks him. And here's what Jesus said to him. Oh, I'm sorry. I am way ahead. Let's go way back. We'll get to Nicodemus in a minute. This is way back at the beginning of the Bible. On the first page of your Bible, this is God creating people. And the first thing that you can tap into is this thing that is lined out in this passage. God spoke, and actually it was Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and he said, let us make humans in our image, make them reflecting our nature so they can be responsible for the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, the cattle, and yes, the earth itself, and every animal that moves on the face of the earth. There's a ton of stuff in there that, that we could pull out today, including our responsibility as humans on the face of planet earth. You can see that in there. But I want to back up to the beginning of that passage where God says, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. There's a piece of God in you. Not P-E-A-C-E, -E, P-I-E-C-E, -E, like when you get a piece of pie. There's a piece of God in you. God put it in there. He made you with that nature. Now, the unfortunate part is we often get it covered up 
with all sorts of problems. People who have hurt us, things we disagree with, sin in our own lives, our own broken nature, the brokenness in the family we grew up in, the brokenness on the school ground that we participated in or were the victim of. By the time we get to be adults, that peace of God that's in us tends to get buried under an avalanche of junk. Which means that it's really hard for us to tap into because it's really hard to find. But you know, every once in a while we do. Yeah. He goes on to say this. God created human beings. He created them godlike, reflecting God's nature. He created them male and female. Friends, here's the big takeaway. You and I, we have something deep inside us that calls us to draw our personal circle of love around whom? Everyone. It's in you. It's that thing inside you that when you're driving down the road and the car in front of you rolls and there's a big cloud of dust and your mind and imagination goes wild, and you pull over to the side of the road, and you run to that vehicle, and you don't care what color their skin is, you don't care what they've done, you, you don't care if you agree with them, you don't ask what political party they're from, you don't care. Why? Because there's something deep inside you that says, that person is my neighbor. I will take unbelievable risks to help them right now. It's why you feel guilty when you don't do what you know you should. There's a peace of God in you. And it's calling for you. It's already there. It's calling you to a lifestyle that's transcendent. It's the best version of you possible. And it's already in you. You have the wonderful privilege of just tapping into it and finding it and allowing it to begin to shape your life into what God always knew you could be. And really, if you thought about it, you always knew you could be. But that's not where the good news ends. Everybody that walks the face of planet Earth has that already. That means, here's the sad truth, when you and I turn on our TVs and we see the next mass shooting, as sad as that is, and as horrific as that is, the person wielding the gun still has that peace of God inside them. But it is so, so covered up. It literally has no effect on their life. Is it hard for us to draw a circle of love around them? It is. But they are still human. They are still our neighbor. And you and I know that perhaps if the right person had come into their life, they could be different. Someone who could have helped them find that peace of God in them. Now to the story of Nicodemus, which I so wonderfully set up about 10 minutes ago, all right? I will not go back and tell you that whole story, all right? But this is Jesus' good buddy, and they're talking about this kingdom. Here's what Jesus said that rocked Nicodemus. He said, unless a person submits to this new creation... And then he explains, in the verse previous to that, Jesus had said to Nicodemus, you have to be born again. To which Nicodemus is thinking, dude, my mom's not going to like that. <laughs> yeah. 
And Jesus says, whoa, whoa, time out. Let me tell you, it's a new creation. Unless a person submits to this new creation, the invisible moving the visible. The invisible God moving inside the visible, the human being. A baptism into a new life. We talk about that often at New Life. And certainly every time we baptize someone, that this is about leaving the old life and being baptized into a new way of living, a new life, this new creation. It's not possible to enter God's kingdom. He goes on to explain the person who takes shape within is formed by something you can't see or touch. Wow. Not only do you and I have a peace of God in us, when we invite Jesus into our lives, when we become Christians and decide to follow him with our life, when we invite Jesus into our life, there's a whole new fresh wind of new life that comes into us. The the invisible moving inside the visible forming in us something that you can't touch or see. The Spirit of God does this. And notice what happens. And the person becomes a living spirit. That there's a whole new way of life that is birthed in us. Remember I talked about the lens that comes down and we see life differently and the fact that Jesus changes our heart and it's like we get a spiritual heart transplant day after day after day after day. And you know what? When what we see is changed and when how we feel is changed, what we do automatically changes. Always does. This is the Jesus effect. So here's the big takeaway. When we invite Jesus into our lives, he gives new life to our God nature. And he begins shaping us around it. It's phenomenal. But you and I have a role to play in that. So here's what our role is. First of all, we have to invite him in. Okay? Jesus is a gentleman. He's not going to beat down the door of your heart and say, I'm here to take over. Step aside. No, he comes by invitation only. And when you invite him into your life, he comes in and he will begin to shape you. But he does it not magically. Jesus doesn't step in with a wand and go, and all of a sudden, no one knows you. Because you have gone from the queen of mean to, to, you know, Miss Wonderful. That's not how it happens. It happens through ordinary conversations with God about what's going on inside here. And the truth is, the more conversations you have with God, and the more open you are with Him in those conversations and the less guarded you are with him in those conversations and the more that you will dare to talk to him about even the yucky stuff in your life that you don't like and are ashamed of, the more you haul that out with God and talk with him and then listen to what he has to say, the more permission he has to shape your life into something beautiful. I said a while ago, you have a peace of God inside you. Well, that peace of God has the ability to actually receive messages from him. I'm not talking about hearing voices necessarily. I'm not talking about uh, any of that stuff. I'm talking about receiving a message in your spirit that you know comes from God. And as you have these conversations, God's spirit will do something else. He'll start prompting you to do something outside your comfort zone. 
Isn't that where we love to live outside our comfort zone? Of course not. That's why we draw our circle of love to specifically exclude the people we don't understand, disapprove of, who have, or who have hurt us. We don't want to be next to them. But the Spirit of God will begin to prompt us. See that person over there? Go talk to them. You'll be standing in line. The person ahead of you is fumbling through their wallet or pocketbook and they're a couple dollars short. And the Spirit of God will say, pay the difference. Here, let me help you with that. You'll be pushing your grocery cart out to your car and you'll be watching someone struggling with a large package and the Spirit will say to you, go help that person. And you'll walk up to them and say, hey, may I help you? Do you have any little practices that really help you? I'll share with you a practice I have that God's Spirit talked to me a long time ago about. He said, Ron, it would be good for you if every time you pulled in a parking lot, instead of going into the store, go find a cart and push it back where it belongs. But God, most of the time I don't need a cart. He said, it's not for what you need. But God, I'm not helping anybody. It's just a cart. I know. But it's part of what I'm using to shape you into a kind, gentle, caring, helpful person when no one's watching and when no one cares. It's just one thing. See, ordinary conversations with God. And then when we listen and he prompts us, he changes our life. I want to tell you a story and read you one, one, uh, one more of my favorite passages from the Bible. This guy is Rusambana Mathode. Uh, you can forget the name, but don't forget the picture, okay? He's from Rwanda. And when he was six years old, he saw something he, no six-year-old should ever have to see. In fact, no human being should ever have to see. In, in, the, in the hundred days of the Rwandan genocide, when he was six years of age, he saw his dad, his mom, and all of his siblings murdered right in front of him. I wonder how many times he's replayed that video in his head. That's something he can't forget. As a six-year-old, he was left to wander the streets, look for food, and effectively he went from person to person, day after day, basically asking one question. Are you my neighbor? Will you be my neighbor today and give me something to eat? What went on inside him during those days, here's how he described it. I was too young to join the military, but because all of all that had happened to me and all the anger I had, I wanted to become a soldier to get revenge for my family. Who could blame him? Enter a Jesus follower who said, I'll not only be your neighbor today and give you something to eat, why don't you come with me? And he took Methode under his wing and took him to a wonderful Christian organization. And I know that some of you in our audience participate in. It's called Compassion International. Great organization. And they began to care for him. And they began to meet his needs. And they began to teach him about Jesus. And when he was 11, five years later when he was 11, he made the decision to follow Jesus with his life. 
And through compassion, he was able eventually to enter a university where he began to participate in the student club of genocide survivors, and he became one of its principal leaders. He went on to graduate from university, and he started his own business, which today is very successful. It's a tourism business. And get this, most of his employees, he's a Tutsi. Most of his employees are Hutus, the very people who killed his parents. That's the Jesus effect. That's not something Methodi did on his own. That was someone who helped him find that peace of God that was already in him. And the decision that he made to invite Jesus into his life and say, would you breathe life into this peace of you that's already in me? And Jesus did. And it completely changed the shape of his life. It's why I chose to become a Jesus follower years ago, and it's why I invite and encourage everybody I know, you want to become a Jesus follower because it's the greatest thing in the world that could ever take place in your life. I want to read this passage as we close. This was written by a guy who hated Jesus originally and and ended up becoming a Jesus follower. He said, here's why we can be so sure that every detail in our lives of love for God is worked into something good because God knew what he was doing from the beginning. Can you say amen to that? (laughs) Yes, God knew what he was doing. Yeah, hello, that's not a big revelation. How does this work? He decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love him along the same lines as the life of whom? Of his son, Jesus. That's the Jesus effect. Our lives begin to take on his shape. He goes on to write, we see the original and intended shape of our lives in Jesus. If you've ever read the life of Jesus, do you realize you're reading the shape that God intended for your life to be. That's such an awesome thing. He goes on to say, after God made that decision of what his children should be like, he followed it up by calling people by name. You're here this morning. You know what that means? It means that God is actually calling you by name. He knew you would be here today. If you're a Jesus follower already, he's calling you by name, saying, come have these conversations with me so I can shape your life. And when I prompt you to do something, instead of excusing why you don't want to do that, just do it. And and trust that I'll meet you in it. And in the process of doing it, I'll shape your life. And for those of us who are not Jesus followers, he's calling us by name and saying, why don't you come and invite me into your life? Because I will bring with me something absolutely supernatural that will change your life. He goes on to say, after he called them by name, he set them on a solid basis with himself. That's what most churches call salvation. That's where you get your sins forgiven by God so your relationship with God is made right through Jesus. And then, after getting them established, he stayed with them to the end, gloriously completing what he had begun. I'm going to close with a time of prayer. And for those of us who are not yet Jesus followers, I'm going to give you a short prayer that you can pray. And then I want to encourage you to stop by our info uh, desk out there. We have what we call a New Believers Quick Start Packet. It will, it, there's a little thing in there for you to read that will really help you. It's actually, it's actually the life of Jesus. So when we talk about the Jesus effect, this is the story of his life straight from the Bible. I think you'll enjoy that. And it will help you get started and to learn how to have those everyday conversations 
with God, with Jesus that will shape your life. So I'll give you that short prayer and you can do that. For those of us who are early Jesus followers, I have a prayer for us as well. Let's, let's pray. God, for we are so blessed, so blessed that you decided to love us in the middle of our mess. And when we look at our world, it's a mess. And we have all contributed to that mess in some way. Thank you for deciding to love us. Thank you for choosing this most amazing thing that if we'll invite you into our life, you will shape us to become like Jesus. And God, if there's anything we'd want, it, 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 we would want to be like Jesus. And God, for those of us who are now not yet Jesus followers, this is our prayer. And friend, you can pray this prayer right where you are. Jesus, thank you for promising to change my life in the most wonderful way. Today, I choose to follow you for the rest of my life and to engage and to stay engaged with you through everyday conversations. And I trust that you will set me right with God. I pray in your name. Amen.